Hello, 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 everyone. Week six is here. Three weeks left in the whole class. And uh, I want you guys to focus, stay strong, don't give up or slack off. The end is near and it is going to be okay. So um, let's just let's just uh, get into week six and then I'm going to, now that most of all of you have turned in, well, I think all of you have turned in your first assignments, I can briefly go over some of those assignments if there were any questions. You'll see that we were very generous in the way we graded as long as you pretty much did the assignment the way we asked you to. Um, but this week, we're going to focus on utilizing appropriate hermeneutical skills in the interpretation of New Testament narrative and identify gospel passages by form and then discuss an interpretation of the parable of the prodigal son. Here's your reading. And then uh, ISA Numero... Gospels analysis. Compare Matthew 22, 34 to 40 and its parallels in the other synoptic gospels. Synoptic gospels meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke. John is not a synoptic gospel if you are very confused about that. Um, so just compare the parallel passage in uh, Luke or Mark with Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Determine these parallels on your own. How are they similar? Identify the form of Matthew 22, 34 to 40. The Gospels Analysis Worksheet is provided for you in the Lesson 6 resource folder to help you with this. Um, I forgot to go ahead. Usually I go in there and open it up real fast. Gospels Analysis Worksheet. And then you'll also need to read Love Wins, Chapter 7 by Rob Bell. We are not condoning what Rob Bell writes in that book. We are using it as an opportunity to do biblical interpretation and to be... Um, to be analysts critically of his work there. So here is the Gospels analysis uh, worksheet. Four little pieces here. As per usual, you will um, just, I actually like it if you put it in bold, put them in bold and then right underneath there. So compare the parallels of the passage in question. Use the chart below. You'll see a chart is right here. So you actually don't need to write here. Sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so for number one, compare the parallels of the passage in question. So um, you actually have to find where in Mark and Luke the same passage that is in Matthew 22, 34 to 40 of the prodigal son. Uh, you have to find where in Mark and where in Luke that is. And so um, what you're doing is um, you're, you're, simply, you're simply making some observations of the... Uh, of the uh, parallels, the similarities and differences. So um, what what I'd like you to do is, um, and you can do more than one, I mean you, you simply, I, we've had a couple things here for you, but the whole point is use this chart and keep making new, I don't know, yeah, you can just click there and you can keep making more observations. So I want you to go through when you can say you know, you'll see differences if it's exactly the same you don't say anything but you're gonna you're gonna make some differences in the accounts between them so Matthew and Luke might be exactly the same you comment there but you said Mark how's that different um, and it can be anything uh, we want you to and then and then it's primarily when you get into these sections you're saying what did it say okay so Matthew said he was wearing brown sneakers Mark said he was wearing red Luke said he was wearing yellow sneakers. Obviously, that's a ridiculous example. That doesn't happen. But then you, the observation would be what? Try to make sense of or give a rationale or explain what the differences mean um, if there are differences. Um, that's what you're doing in observation. So really, on the under here, you're simply stating the differences. The observation section is when you're kind of giving some what does it mean that... that uh, the, of the differences. You're making sense of the differences, you're talking about the connotation or what we do with the fact that they were different um, in, in uh, the different um, sections there. Then, number two, note what comes before and after the passage in question and its parallels. Is there something that suggests a connection between one pericope and another? A pericope just means one um, uh, one instance in another. So. It's, it's all it's asking you to do is know what comes before and after the passage in question in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. 
okay? And and then is there is there something that suggests a connection between one and the other? So um, all you're doing is you're 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 looking at each um, instance of 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 uh, this passage in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You're looking the, at the section before and after it in each one, and then um, is there something that connects a suggestion, or a, sorry, is there something that suggests a connection? Um, so um, if if Matthew has something before and after, and Mark has something before and after, are there connections between Matthew and Mark in that way? Um, or Luke and so forth. So you're, you're really trying to connect the gospel passages around the prodigal son by then comparing how does Matthew place that account? What is he talking about before and after he talks about this instance? What is Mark talking about before and after? And what's Luke talking about before and after this account? And, and how do you draw any connections between the three gospel accounts because of what they have before and after, okay? And then, thirdly, identify the form of Matthew 22, 34 to 40. So the passage of Matthew, the original passage we're studying in Matthew, right here you'd say, what's the form? This is the categories of form that are provided in the Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard reading. So if you don't know what that means, you need to devour Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard until you figure out what the different forms are, and then you make um, a decision on what you think Matthew is. Also, as usual, it's a good idea to put a rationale. Um, if you just put the correct answer and you get it correct, you'll get full credit. But if you put the if, it, if you put an incorrect answer, but you have a good rationale, at least I can see your thought process, you'll still get some points. So it's a good idea to put a rationale there of why you're saying what form it is. And finally, provide a statement describing the overall message of the passage in no more than one paragraph, but please make it better than one sentence. So, um, you know, doing a study like this should help you to, to give a deeper uh, message than just the, like, you've heard this story a million times. Um, you've probably heard it preached on. You've had it in Sunday school. You've read children's stories and all sorts of things. But doing a study like this should help you have a more robust understanding of the overall message. Put it in context of Jesus' overall message of the Gospels, not just a moral um, uh, or philosophical truth. Um, about a loving father or something like that. But you need to put it into the context of the overall narrative of the Gospels and where they're going with it. So make sure you do that, and you'll do fine. That's, uh, so that's the Gospels analysis. Um, now, let's see. Let's go back to the front page, and we'll talk about your discussion board. We, I may have to make a separate video talking about the assignments, which is fine if I have to do that. Okay, so your discussion for this week. Uh, to complete this discussion board, you will need to read guidelines for interpreting Jesus' parables. Um, so, let's see if it's uh, right here. You need to click on that and, and read this article, Guidelines for Interpreting Jesus' Parables. You need to read that before doing the week six discussion board. As well as read the chapter um, on Love Wins, which I just pointed out is in the Lesson 6 resource folder there. By Rob Bell. So you're going to discuss the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of the speaker's exposition in light of the principles set forth in the guidelines for interpreting Jesus' parables. So what, what, the, what the, does that mean? Okay, all we're asking you to do here, so the discussion is really going to be on Rob Bell's um, uh, exposition in chapter 7 of Love Wins. That's what the discussion board is on. You're going to dissect and critique um, his his uh, chapter 7 and uh, what he does with scripture there and, and the interpretation he gets from, from the text. So you're going to be finding holes in what he does essentially is what you're going to be doing. Um, now, to help you as a guideline of how to do that, that's what this is for. The guidelines for interpreting Jesus' parables. So Rob Bell is going to interpret one of Jesus' parables. You're going to use this article. I'll go ahead and click on it and open it. You're going to use this, um, this little article here to help you as kind of a, a template to, um, to doing that. So how, okay, so let me just real quickly kind of touch on some of the, the stuff here. So 
Um, it gives kind of an introduction here, understanding the setting of a parable. So when you when you go into a parable, you understand the setting, the historical setting, the cultural setting. Um, then you uncover the need prompted by the parable. So parables typically uncover some sort of need that Jesus is addressing. You analyze the structure and the details of the parable. Um, they get into how and then state the central truth of the parable and its relationship to the kingdom. Why? Because whenever Jesus is, is talking about, you know, whenever Jesus is, is using a parable, he is um, almost always explaining something about how the kingdom works. It's often why he begins a parable saying something to the effect of, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, or the, the kingdom is like this. It's, it's um, uh, Jesus is essentially describing what his kingdom is like. And he's using a parable to help you understand that. So you state the central truth of the parable and its relationship to the kingdom. If you can't do that with the interpretation that you're drawing or someone else is drawing from a parable, you might want to start there in your critique of what they're doing to say, hey, they, they made this comment or this observation, but I don't see how that aligns with what Jesus is doing and tying this back to how the kingdom works. Um, so it gives you some tidbits there on how to determine the central ter to central truth. What terms are repeated? Upon what does the parable dwell? What is the main contrast? What comes at the end of the parable? What is spoken in the direct discourse? So uh, some of the things that we've already said, but this gives you kind of like a very clear outline. Um, talks more about relationship to the kingdom. And then respond to the intended appeal of the parable. So critical scholarship is tended to overlook the historical setting of the parables in the life of Jesus. Also, the presuppositions of critical scholars who see parables as only metaphors cloud their interpretation. So if he's only talking about this as a metaphor, it's hard to understand fully of what he's doing. Um, so then there's a summary he gives at the end. But the point is, and you see all these, these uh, citations he used, that means it's a scholarly article when he does something like that. But the point is, is that you can simply use this one article that gives an overview of how to interpret a parable of Jesus. Use this one article and then read Love Wins Chapter 7 and, and throw all sorts of holes in it. Okay, so um, that's essentially what you're doing in your discussion board this week. So the discussion takes some time this week. So this is not something that you can do in 10 minutes. Um, this should take you a while to read those um, those uh, chapters and articles and then to do that. So I'm going to really need to see evidence that you've done the reading and have thought through this to get full credit on the discussion board this week. Okay, So it's not difficult by any stretch, but it does take some time and it's a really fun exercise by taking a, a book that's a, um, I don't know, it was definitely popular uh, you know, a few years ago when you wrote it. Um, got a lot of buzz amongst the Moody's because that was the book that Rob Bell wrote. He was a very popular evangelical um, author and pastor that uh, a lot of Christians um, at Moody followed very closely. Um, and then he kind of uh, started delving into some stuff that, that we can analyze hermeneutically um, and, and find some issues with. So have fun with that. Now, here's the challenge. Not everything Rob Bell says is wrong. And not all his work is, is terrible now that he has made some very bad hermeneutical issues. Now, the, the challenge for you is to chew the meat and spit the bones. And this is a great example of how to do that. Although, primarily what we're doing with the, just this one chapter is finding problems with it, I, I will admit. So, um, but have fun with it and do a good job with it. And let me know if you have any questions. All right? Let me pray for you as you start this week. Father, I thank you for these Amazing students have another week to study in the midst of so many things. I pray for peace, wisdom, clarity, and sound mind for them to be able to uh, grasp and chew and delve into their studies with absolute confidence of what they're doing. Um, in light of all that's happening in the world and all that's happening in their lives and all the distractions that they have, uh, I pray that they would focus, but I also just pray that what you deposit in them from them spending time in prayer, in reflection, in meditation, and in your word on hermeneutics and on interpretation, that you would deposit rich, rich, valuable truths and skills and nuggets of wisdom that are going to transform their Bible study, transform their relationship with you, transform their quiet times, transform their teaching, and would start a, a trend to help them become all you want them to be. 
Amen.